Now, if you are like me, the recent release of the Witcher series on Netflix might have put you in a certain mood. You suddenly want to start mixing potions again, commenting to yourself about the wind, and going on hunting monsters. Basically, you want to play the Witcher games and experience it all again. But it's not just the story and the world presented in these games which has driven their popularity. Starting with The Witcher 2 and the debut of the Red Engine from CD Projekt Red, the technology powering these games drove their popularity and awareness. So in this video, I will jump a few years back in time to dig into the tech behind The Witcher 2 and discuss what made it so special on release, where its limitations were, and how these aspects laid the foundation for the future. I will also look at the game maxed out on modern mid-ranged hardware and give settings recommendations for those of you looking to play it again in 2020. Can it easily be run maxed out at 1080p60 now? To find out, let's grab our swords, cast a sign, and investigate the tech behind The Witcher 2. The Witcher 2 is partially so technologically interesting because of the time when it released. It was an awkward time. On one hand, you have the PC platform which the game was released on as the lead development platform. In 2011, some who championed the PC platform had long said it was dead. Microsoft, one of the key players for PC gaming, was only supporting the platform in a much more limited fashion than previously had, and perhaps in a regressive manner if you consider the Games for Windows Live initiative. Even newer studios who created legendary PC games considered PC a second-class platform in 2011. At the same time, the console generation of the Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii was basically entering its sixth year. So, the advancements of visuals in the console space was hitting its peak. Developers had tapped into and extracted much of console's performance with their engines. So greater heights in visual realism, poly count, and effects invariably meant hits to performance and resolution. Still, there were two years until the next generation of consoles were to release that would up the baseline of what was possible in real-time rendering and games. In this awkward cross-generational period, The Witcher 2's PC-centric release was refreshing as it showcased visuals that were a tier above what consoles were capable of at that time and embraced many of the PC platform's strengths. It is one of the first of a number of games at the tail end of that generation of consoles, such as Far Cry 3, Battlefield 3 or Crisis 3, where the PC release on its highest settings showcased visuals that were much closer to those visuals that we would start seeing in the next generation consoles. Essentially, The Witcher 2 was ahead of the curve in many aspects. So in what ways? I think one of the most obvious standout visual aspects in The Witcher 2, even visible in pre-release screenshots from the game, was the detail of individual game assets. Essentially, the model and texture work of the game on characters and in the environments. For the time of its release in 2011, The Witcher 2 had character and environmental models with a very high poly count, meaning that edges on models were much smoother than the average AAA game then. And the amount of detail on models represented by real geometry instead of just textures was much higher than was typically found in your average game. Take the opening scenes of the game in the Temerian Dungeon. If you look across many of the surfaces, the individual assets you will see here have incredible detail for the time of release. Like here, the chains in the torture room above Geralt, where each individual link is a well-rounded geometric object, and the instruments hanging from those chains are fully modeled out in 3D. Or you can look at the table where the guards are chatting at. Notice how the texture and geometric detail of the objects on that table, such as the skull with the helmet, or even the candle, hold up as the camera zooms in. Even the environment of the dungeon walls and the floor itself managed to utilize an impressive amount of geometry to represent individual outcrops and stones. Like here, the tile on the ground is geometrically represented instead of just being a simple normal mapped texture. 
Even the trough in the floor of the torture chamber manages to be fully 3D, and quite round at that. But it wasn't just indoors. Outdoor scenes around Flotsam are thick with undergrowth and dense geometry covered in dappled lighting from the detailed trees above. The environments were just the stage, though, for the drama unfolding between the characters here. And those characters are generally what stole the show in 2011. Both in-game and in cutscenes, or in dialogue conversations, the character models share the same asset on the highest settings, and The Witcher 2 showcased very detailed models for its time, especially if you compare it to its contemporaries in the genre. The main character cast of Jorvith, Roche, Triss, and Geralt have rich models with very high resolution textures, and interestingly, even the side cast of just random world NPCs looked excellent and managed to hold up quite well as the camera gets close. In The Witcher 2, your average townsperson, soldier, or guard had texture resolutions and polygon counts rivaling those of the main cast, and they generally appeared in very large numbers at this level of quality, whether that means soldiers milling about or just crowds of highly detailed NPCs in the town areas. Through the lens of modern game graphics, this may seem mundane, but in 2011, the level of detail found on these character models and environmental assets was not common. And there's a good reason for that. The Witcher 2's highest settings to achieve these textures and poly counts on individual models required hardware which exceeded that of those found in the consoles. The Witcher 2's highest settings reserved 600 megabytes of GPU memory by itself, not including the space required for other assets such as geometry or the frame buffer. So more memory was required for the game's textures than either the PS3 or Xbox 360 had in total RAM amount. That amount of geometric detail on screen, well that was just downright impossible on that era of console hardware. And the best proof I have for it is the excellent downport of The Witcher 2 on Xbox 360 that was released nearly a year later in 2012. We have covered this port on the channel before, as it is mighty impressive what CD Projekt Red managed to do here in upgrading the Red Engine to get the game working so well on Xbox 360. But the cuts they made, in addition to optimizations, are readily visible. Basically every single geometric asset on screen has reduced polygon counts, such as character models, even when they are close to the camera. And textures, well, those lovely armor textures found in the PC version or environmental textures are much reduced on Xbox 360. So consoles did not have the chance to run such high quality models at real time at that time. But even on PC, there were some compromises there in The Witcher 2. The Witcher 2 shipped as a DirectX 9 game, and that aging APIs, lack of multi-threading, and the game's single-threaded performance reliance meant, among other things, that the level of detail switching even on the highest settings in The Witcher 2, looks aggressive by 2020 PC standards. Just walking around in many of the game hub areas, you will see the geometric level of detail popping in multiple times as the camera gets closer to the objects. It was not completely jarring for the time exactly, but it was a necessary concession given the GPUs of the time, the amount of polygons on the models themselves, and the fact that the game did just not utilize quad and 8-threaded machines too well. The asset quality was not the only defining feature in the game, as The Witcher 2 shipped with a state-of-the-art lighting system as well, based on a deferred renderer, enabling many lights on the screen at a time in comparison to classical forward renderers. All of the primary lighting in The Witcher 2 is rendered dynamically in real time. So the sun casts real time lighting, where the individual characters and objects in the scene cast shadow maps onto themselves and onto the world. Likewise, all smaller lighting indoors or outdoors from torches and fire and the like are also rendered with dynamic lighting. And these smaller lights occasionally could even cast real time shadows themselves, like you see in this dungeon scene here in the prologue. This adherence to real-time lighting also applied largely to the game's indirect lighting. In indoor scenes where lighting did not actually change much, global illumination or bounce light was emulated with manually placed point lights. Like here in the dungeon again, where a light is placed near the ground in the color of the sunlight to make it look as if light is bouncing up from the floor. It produces quite a nice sheen on the metals in the scene, like on the Iron Maiden here. Outdoor scenes though take a more simplistic and less manual approach. In the hub and overworlds, there's an ambient brightness added into shadow regions to prevent them from being totally black, like you might have seen in Doom 3 for example. Then over this ambient color, CD Projekt Red implemented screen space ambient occlusion 
to simulate the shadowed occlusion of bounced ambient lighting on static and dynamic world objects. With this adherence to real-time solutions for direct and indirect lighting and shadowing, The Witcher 2 was able to have a fully dynamic time of day in any of the hub and open locations in the game world. This allowed you to experience these locations at different times of the day, even with different weather like rain, which heavily increases the distance fog, brings in the in-game depth of field effect closer to the camera, and also applies a wet shader to many of the game's surfaces. It was nifty looking, but the time of day also gave your actions in the game a sense of time, and even plays into the gameplay systems with some AI routines and quests feeding into time of day changes. It added a further layer into the game's storytelling. But real time all the time had its costs, especially in 2011. So while GPUs from the age like the steaming hot Fermi based GTX 480 or the then newly released Radeon 6870 were powerful enough to enable such lighting without destroying frame rates, there were concessions to make that possible alongside the high quality assets on screen at that time. So there may be real time shadow maps from the sun, but the resolution of the shadow maps leaves much to be desired by 2020 standards. When moving the camera, the low resolution tends to make them jitter and look rather distracting. And also, they seem to have a screen space dither which crosshatches the edges. This is reduced at higher resolutions, but it is ever present nonetheless. And those rarer shadows from point lights indoors? They are of a low resolution, without any filtering, as you can see on Geralt's shadow cast onto the wall here. It's pretty jagged looking. Also, it would appear that CD Projekt Red elected to disable self-shadowing on characters for such lights, as they are too low res and cause problems, something which you can really see well here in this cutscene where they elect to use it on Letho's face. The low resolution and rudimentary filtering of the point light shadows leave stilted and jagged shadows on Letho's face, which contrasts rather poorly with the comparatively high quality of the character model. And since this is before the more widespread adoption or invention even of real-time indirect lighting solutions such as pre-computed radiance transfer like we saw in Far Cry 3, or light propagation volumes as we saw in Crisis 2 or Crisis 3 on PC, the scenes in The Witcher 2 outdoors look competent with shadow maps and SSAO, but shadowed regions do lack an expected bounce light of color. So being real-time all the time in 2011 had its limitations, but for the time it was really the peak performance and visuals you could expect in many games. So the game had great looking assets and state of the art lighting, with some necessary compromises to enable them. And if you needed to, you could scale them even lower with the game's vast array of visual options. But alongside those standard options to scale textures, shadow resolution, and model LODs downward, the game shipped with two optional extremely high end settings a tradition which this game established and would be seen again in The Witcher 3. So how do these max settings run in 2020? Well, on an AMD RX 580 and GTX 1060, they still crush. At 1080p with every setting maxed, most of the gameplay will be far below 60 FPS, with the combat sections in the game here spending most of the time in the middle 40s on the RX 580 and just above the 30 FPS line on the GTX 1060. Cutscenes see a similar story, but with the gap widening between the two cards. The RX 580 sees extremely wild swings in performance depending upon what is on screen, from the low 30s up into heights of the 50s, while the GTX 1060 is more consistent but a much lower 30 FPS or sub 30 FPS in the 20s. I imagine that is due to a single aspect of the GPU limiting the overall performance heavily on the GTX 1060. So how is this game running so poorly so many years later? It is all because of those two extremely high-end settings options that I mentioned earlier. First you have the UBA sampling option, which is just a cheeky way of saying 2x2 two two ordered grid super sampling. Oh boy, do I remember all the cries of this game is unoptimized when people unwittingly had this option on. That UBA sampling option enabled in The Witcher 2 made the game at 1080p actually render internally at 4K. And at 4K, it is actually internally rendering at 8K. Back in 2011, this option made the game more or less unplayable at HD resolutions. But in the near 10 years since its initial release, it is a much more viable choice these days. If you are playing the game at 1080p or 1440p today, 
I would actually recommend turning on UBS sampling if you have a GPU with performance similar to a GTX 1080 or RTX 2060 and are targeting 60 FPS. UBS sampling will produce better edges than the standard downsampling with less overhead. And it also helps since the game's terrain textures curiously do not support hardware anastropic filtering. So even at 4K with 16 times AF forced in the driver, the game will still have muddy textures on terrain into the distance. With UBS sampling enabled, those same terrain textures look much better. If you're playing the game though in 2020 at 4K, or are targeting high frame rates like 120 FPS, then UBS sampling will probably not be on the table. Even the mighty RTX 2080 Ti is dropped below 60 FPS at 4K with UBS sampling on. Although it is just a bit under 60 FPS in most gameplay scenes, which is pretty impressive considering the game is running at 8K. The second infamous forward scaling option the game shipped with is cinematic depth of field. Basically, the PC version of the game offered an extremely high quality, native resolution bokeh depth of field effect, which in 2011 was not common at all, especially at this quality. I mean, just look at this shot here of Yorvith. That depth of field looks absurdly good for a game from this era, and is higher quality than that even found in many modern games. It has its cost though. You don't need to take my word for it, but Vronsky, the programmer who coded it, describes the depth of field himself as insane. Since the game was running under DX9, it tests the limits of the API to achieve the quality and feature set that the depth of field had. Essentially, it is a bandwidth virus that scales with resolution, has two passes for near and far plane depth of field, and its performance cost corresponds with the size of the bokeh effect in out of focus regions. The larger the bokeh shapes are, the more expensive it is. How expensive? Expensive enough to make a 2080 Ti croak in 2020. Utilizing the standard in-game ultra settings at 4K with no super sampling or UBS sampling enabled, cinematic depth of field off and just standard Gaussian depth of field in its place, the RTX 2080 Ti is managing healthily above 60 FPS, usually in excess of 100 FPS at 4K. If you turn on cinematic depth of field, many of those same scenes now are in the 40s or in the 30s, with extreme close-ups where the depth of field enlarges in size, dropping the frame rate into the low 20s. Yeah, I think I would call that insane. If you are running the game today on a modern GPU, I still recommend turning this option off at any resolution above 1440p, which is what I did in this video to make it a flawless 60 FPS. Cutscenes will not look nearly as fancy, but you will not see jarring FPS drops in them. And it goes without saying, but do not combine the cinematic depth of field option with UBA sampling. Perhaps in 10 years or so, but not now. The Witcher 2 pushed out ahead of its contemporaries in terms of asset detail, with great looking character models, highly detailed environments, and high resolution textures. It also made the daring switch to real-time all the time lighting at a time when most games still baked much if not all their scene lighting. In doing so, CD Projekt Red made an excellent looking game that could test the best PCs out at the time, but also importantly laid the groundwork for the future in The Witcher 3. That real-time all the time lighting and variable quests based upon time of day that was definitely heavily expanded upon in the sequel. And even in those areas where the game did not shine so brightly, lessons were definitely learned that would be looked at in the sequel, The Witcher 2 being very reliant on single-threaded CPU performance and being DX9 was not a deal breaker in 2011, but it did negatively affect the way the game scales over time. The Witcher 3 though is a radically different story in comparison, and that is where I will leave it for now, as that story is one for the future. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this look back at the excellent The Witcher 2. If you did enjoy it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, then please consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk to me about the Red Engine or The Witcher 2, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell und auf Wiedersehen!